Amen. It's a great blessing to be able to preach God's word. Let's turn to Acts chapter 18. Believe God to help us. I read about Leonardo da Vinci, the great painter and great genius of his day. And he was in the studio uh, with a number of his students there, and he began a painting on a large canvas, chose the subject, planned the perspective, sketched the outline, applied some of the colors, all with his usual uh, ability and creativity. Then suddenly he stopped, the, the painting still very much unfinished. Da Vinci called up one of his students, handed him the brush, and told him to complete the work. Understandably, the student protested that he was unworthy and unable to complete a painting which his master had begun. But da Vinci replied by saying, will not what I have done inspire you to do your best? Christ, our master, has begun a great work of redemption for mankind. And he said, it is finished on the cross as far as the price. But what is left unfinished is now the proclaiming of that message 2,000 years ago by what he said, by what he did, and by what he suffered as he died and rose from the dead. He now wants us to complete this masterpiece of world evangelism by participating in bringing the powerful gospel message to a dying world. I want to preach a message I've called Finishing the Masterpiece out of Acts 18. Let's read verse 8 through 11. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them, finishing the masterpiece. I want to look at three things that Jesus said in this portion of scripture that can bring encouragement and direction to us. First of all, he said, do not be afraid. It's very interesting that God would speak to Paul and say, do not be afraid. Because this is Paul. He's the, the champion. He's the, the missionary of missionaries. Here's the man that boldly uh, proclaimed the word of God. Why do you suppose God would say this to Paul? The truth is God never wastes his words. And you have to conclude that there's a really good chance that God said to Paul, do not be afraid, because at that time, Paul was battling fear. If you read prior to this, Paul was not exactly hitting it out of the park. He was having a rough time. He was not getting the response that he wanted. In light of what God says, it's safe to assume that maybe at this moment he was not experiencing a burning desire to witness on that day. Which means, just like every believer, Paul would have been battling an emotional resistance to outreach. I want you to just get your head around that for a minute. Our flesh will rise up against evangelism just like it will anything else that the Spirit of God privileges us to be involved in. The flesh resists prayer. The flesh resists forgiveness. The flesh resists reading the Word of God. And you have to believe that Paul was at this point struggling with an emotional desire to continue to proclaim the gospel. I remember um, years ago in the third church that I pastored, I would have been saved 10 or 15 years by this time. And we were on our way to an outdoor outreach. 
in our city. And we were going to play at a little, small little park that we had a permit for. We're going to play in a band. We're going to preach to the parade crowd that would have been assembled very, very close to this little parcel of park land that we were able to get a permit for. It was one of the great opportunities we, we, we had in this city to preach publicly. It was a grand event. It was a great opportunity. So I want you to picture this. I had been saved for years. I have been pastoring for many years and evangelizing for many years. But as we were en route in the car, I, all of a sudden, something in my flesh began to recoil. I mean, physically, my stomach began to tense up. And my flesh began to just kind of, you know, grit its teeth and begin to plead. You know, I don't know if your, your, <laughs> your lower self ever tries to you know, get your attention and, and plead with you. But it's like my flesh was, was, was debating this, saying to me, really? Really? R we're really going to do this? This is really necessary that we're going to set up and, and we're going to play rock and roll. And then you're going to get on the mic and you're going to confront people about their sin. And, and, and so it was like we get there, we begin to outreach. We have this incredible liberty. I want to tell you, God showed up and there was such a joy when we were done there was such a sense of joy and, and happiness at the grace of God. I marked that. I marked that. I said, you know what? Whenever I feel that in my flesh, I know we're going to have a good outreach. So funny, I, for years I ignored it. I lived against it. I pushed past it for many, many years, even all the way to Kenya even back to the United States and Gallup. But, but uh, very recently, just within the last couple of years, um, on Friday night here in Perth, we are on our way to Murray Street Mall, which is one of the great opportunities in any Western city I have ever been a part of. We can set up there. We can, we can play music. We can preach. We get people saved. It is an amazing, an amazing time. It's funny that on the way there, it happened again. My, my flesh just like, oh my gosh, man. Here we go. I'm going to go to the mall and we're going to preach. And, and, and it, it was like, I thought to myself, you know what? I, I will be saved 40 years in a couple of months. And yet after all these decades of successfully reaching people for Christ, my flesh is still doing this. And just like always, by the time the outreach was over, it was excellent, man. I had prayed with a guy to get saved. The people were open. I, 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 one of the disciples would have preached an altar call and people respond. And I, I, you know, I would grab my wife's hand and we would leave with joy and just get in the car. And I think, man, this is where the action is. And I thought to myself, what, what an amazing dynamic. How many believers are there that never push through that? How many pastors are there? that are called to lead people that never learn to press past that carnal resistance to evangelism. I've preached this sermon a couple times in different places and I've had people comment to me, Pastor Payne, you're kidding me. You, a leader on the board of elders, your flesh does that to you? They thought, I, I thought I was the only one. I said, no, I think this is part and parcel of being a human being. A flesh wars against the spirit. The real pity is, is, is when I look back on this, uh, the, the, you know, this numbers of decades, how many outreaches I've been on, how many opportunities I've had, how much joy this has brought me, I think how many believers never press past that? I'm talking about filled with the Holy Ghost and still struggling with it. How many good believers with a valuable ability just never do press through that? 
And I want to tell you that there is a degree of demonic pushback. There is a degree of spiritual pushback. There is a degree of your own flesh that must be contended against. That's why God said to Paul, Paul, don't be afraid. Because if you look at our text, verse 1 of chapter 18, Paul departed from Athens. He went to Corinth. Verse 5 and 6, when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, verse 6, but they opposed him and blasphemed and shook his garments and said, and he shook his garments and said, your blood be upon your own heads, I will go to the Gentiles. So he's in a moment of discouragement. He's in a moment where things aren't going as well as he wants. So no wonder he's battling this, but verse 8 and 9, God says, then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing believed. And the Lord spoke to Paul and said, do not be afraid. So here we have it. Paul could have stopped short right before one of the great moves of God in his entire ministry. The Corinthian church became a powerhouse the Corinthian church became a mighty force in that generation. But right before he enters into this, uh, this, uh, this level of ministry or this new chapter, something is resisting this. You need to mark that down. Because I believe that there are good people listening to me right now. That you have a powerful ability by the Holy Spirit to testify, to do a work for God, but you've never learned to push back against this resistance in your own heart. You're in good company if you've struggled with this. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 8, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you, and before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said to me, Say not, I am a child. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you. He says, Don't be afraid of their faces. You know, fear, I tell, I tell people, fear is like a paper dragon. Think of a, you know, a tissue paper dragon at the Chinese New Year parade, you know, filled with hot air. Roar! And there it is with a speaker growling and large. And, and it would be easy for a young child to be frightened of that. And, oh my gosh, look at how big and loud and scary that is. But you can walk right up to that thing and just tear a little hole in it. And it's just full of hot air. And there's nothing there. You have to poke it. There's, there's lots of places that this happens. This, this happens to young people in school, especially high school. You know, when you get out of high school, you know what happens when you finally graduate uh, year 12 and you get out? You, you look back and you realize, you know what? That's not even real back there. That's like Disneyland. It's like an alternative universe back there, man. That's not reality. And then you learn that all these people that you signed each other's yearbook, you know, I'll never forget you and we'll always be friends. You know, within a couple of years, you totally lose track of them. Very rare. I mean, it's, it's done, but, you know, most people, those, those people that seem so important, those people that seem so for God. And I, I tell our young people, you know what? I don't mean this in a, in, a, in, a, in a bad way, but those people that you're so concerned about, they're not going to matter. For the rest of your life, they're not going to matter. Their opinions don't matter. And then if you live long enough to go back to reunions, <laughs> and, you know, 10, 15, 20 year reunions, what? You get a real education. When you look at these people that just seem like they had it all together, these were the superstars, you know? These were the, the king and the queen of the graduating class, and, and there they are, and it's like, woo, time has not been kind to you. And you, you think, you know what, this was, this is all very make-believe. 
You know what you have to realize, young people in school, it doesn't matter what grade you're in. Those kids, they're putting on a front. They are, they are as insecure as you, if not more. And if you can just show some confidence and be willing to not fear, you can make a powerful impact. Fronts, you know, people in their fronts. You know, I remember when I was the outreach director in Prescott, we would go to um, downtown Prescott after the music scene during the 4th of July weekend, and there's hundreds of people down there. And we, were, we would do street meetings. And I remember one time I led a, a group of people probably about 120 of us. We're on, we're on the grass. We couldn't get in the sidewalk and we couldn't even use a microphone, but we had, you know, a little kind of a bullhorn thing. And, and, uh, and we're, we're just starting to get going. And I mean, it was chaos. This is like, I wouldn't say Sodom and Gomorrah, but it was crazy. It was a party scene, man. And somebody threw a smoke bomb and, and people are, you know, yelling. And it was just crazy. And I remember we, we just praised God and it just seemed to settle down. And right in the beginning of the outreach, up came this, this group of four or five, you know, mockers. And they decided they were going to stand right in front of us and try to disrupt it. And so I, I just swung into action, man. I just stepped down and, and I tried to size up, you know, who was the ringleader? You know, who was the big mouth? Who was the alpha male that all these other little ducklings want to follow around and be like, you know? So I, I, I located the guy that I thought was the ringleader, and I said, hey, man, can I, can I talk to you for a second? I said, it's really obvious, the impression that you're trying to give everybody right now, you know, that you're cool and you're confident. But can I ask you something? He goes, yeah, sure. I said, when's the last time you threw up all over yourself, man? And immediately these other guys began to snicker. When's the last time you made an absolute fool out of yourself because you had too much to drink or you fell over like a numbskull of... When's the last time you pillowed your head, racked with emptiness and regret? And I'm telling you, this guy, you know, he tried, but he, he couldn't maintain eye contact. He began to look down, and all these other guys began to, to filter off. And what happened was, you just peel back the mask, man. People that are loud and abusive, they're, they're putting up a front. Jesus said, don't be afraid. Because God will give dominion. Acts 8, 7, and 8. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies in the lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So I want to look secondly, then speak and do not be silent. First, don't be afraid, but then speak. The devil's main objective is to keep people, God's people, from testifying to others about Christ. Why? Because it's spiritual. Revelations 19.10, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Just speaking about Jesus Christ is a spiritual event. That's why when people cuss and they use Jesus' name as a, as a cuss word, it's like there's a spiritual reaction in the negative. People don't use Buddha and Muhammad because they don't get that same spiritual vibration and be, there's something about speaking the name of Jesus Christ. If that's true when people are cussing, how much more when people speak for Christ and testify and use his name in a positive way. And the enemy will do anything he can to prevent people from speaking. When uh, Chris Plummer was here on staff, he testified about meeting a man uh, in Murray Street Mall who was a Christian. But he was a little bit different than what we do. He just would stand there and hand out papers to people with instructions as to the correct way to tell people about Jesus. He wasn't witnessing. <laughs> he was wanting to give these papers to other Christians telling them the correct way to witness. And, and Pastor Plummer thought that. That's quite curious. And he started talking to him, and I don't know if it was word of knowledge, and probably was, but Pastor Plummer began to assume something happened to this guy. This isn't natural. 
He said, can I ask you a question? What happened to you? And this young man said, well, when I was a teenager and I got saved, I tried to witness to my friends and they mocked me. And I said, never again. Th that's a pity. So in other words, because he got pushed back and because he had some persecution, he thought he was doing it wrong. So now, years later, rather than pressing past that and speaking for God and realizing that sometimes people will mock, sometimes people will push back. And the people that get the angriest are the ones that are the most convicted. You throw a rock into a pack of dogs and the one that yelps the loudest got hit the hardest. But you can't make, let that stop you. And here's a man, one incident, the first time the devil, and he never again. I immediately thought of the first time I tried to witness. I'll never forget this. Mark Pepich took me to the little shopping center there in Prescott and I had seen this done a little bit. I had uh, seen Louis witness, and I had seen Kevin Foley witness, and so I had my little handful of cartoon books. And I know my memory has probably conflated this, inflated this a bit, but I remember walking up to this, this cowboy dude. And look, I'm pretty tall, so I must be, you know, my, my memory must be enlarging this, but I pictured him to be about like nine feet tall. <laughs> I, this is the way I remember this that I handed a, 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 a Jack Chick track to him, and I began to tell him about Jesus, and this guy came uncorked on me, man. I thought he was going to make me swallow my teeth. I mean, he just, just got right up in my face and reacted, you know. But, you know, the good thing is instead of that causing me to, to fold up my tent, amen, I thought, oh, really? Oh, really? And I just doubled down and uh, began to say, I'm, I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. And, and God was able to accomplish something in my heart. Eventually, I got the hang of it. The devil can't stop by intimidation. He can also stop us by condemnation or a sense of inadequacy. Another thing that you realize about Paul is that he actually struggled with this. We think that he was Mr. Confidence, 2 Corinthians 7 Five and six. For when we were come to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside was fighting, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforts those that are cast down comforted us. See, in our text, he said, don't be silent. But verse 10, he says, I am with you. No one will attack you to hurt you. See, our confidence is not our own wisdom, but God has power that he gives us. One of those is that the word of God is a weapon. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, to whom we must give account. That, that is a powerful scripture that will help you with confidence. Our job is to simply speak God's word, and it's like a sword that pierces. It doesn't mean that we have to be harsh or we have to be cruel or hard. Just the insertion of God's word into the human heart has powerful effect. The Bible says his word is a seed. Jesus explained his word in a parable saying, the seed is the word of God. You know, seeds have a life force of their own. All you need to do to get a seed to grow is to plant it. Once it's planted, the effects of God's creation go to work on it. The, the sunlight and the water, and it begins to germinate. That's the way it is with God's word. Our job is to put the seed in people's hearts, to speak the word of God by faith. You know, seeds take time to grow. But once they grow, they can move rocks. They can break concrete. I had a friend in Prescott when I was there as a disciple, and I went to his house, asked to use his toilet, and went into the bathroom. And they're coming out of the corner behind the toilet is a, an ivy 
growing up the wall, right out of the floor in the, in the, uh, in the bathroom. And these houses in Prescott are old and they shift and somehow a plant got up in there and just began to work its way through and they just decided it was a nice artistic touch so they just kind of let it grow around the room. Where I come from in upstate New York, the sidewalks in front of the houses that are thick concrete are often buckled by, you know, by, by almost a half a meter because of the roots of these trees that just grow. And it's like they can't be stopped. So the Word of God is like a seed. You know, seeds carry, care very little what type of man the farmer is. It would be silly for a farmer to obsess as he's planting seeds. Oh my gosh, I hope... I hope they grow because, you know, I had an attitude problem today. Or I hope they grow because me and my wife are fighting. Or I hope they grow because, you know, I don't read my Bible enough. Look, those seeds just need to be sown. And that's not to say that we live careless lives, but it can be overdone. The power of God's word is way, way independent of the quality of our um, super spirituality. The Bible says the word of God is light. Psalms 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet. When we speak God's word, we turn on the lights. It's irrelevant whether people believe the Bible is God's word. It doesn't change it. And I know sometimes people will try to dodge by saying the, you know, the Bible's been rewritten and you can kind of counter that. But really, you can waste a lot of time on that. It doesn't matter whether they believe it's the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It is a weapon. It is a seed. It is a light, whether people believe it or not. And its effect on their conscience is the same. And so Paul, he refused to be silenced. And he cut and he planted and he shined the light. And verse 11 says he continued there a year and six months, and he had great impact. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord and all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. So I'm going to close then very quickly with the third thing that God said, and that is, I have many people in this city. That's verse 10. Think about that. That's an amazing statement given the fact that the gospel had not been preached there yet. Brand new territory. God said, speak, for I have many people in this city. So that means long before Paul arrived, God was already setting this up. This is a great confidence. What does that mean? That means long before Paul arrived, God was dealing with people from his word. The Jewish population had all the Old Testament promises. They would have had synagogues. And while they rejected their own Messiah, they did not reject everything in the Old Testament. And that seed had impact on them to lead them to Christ. The first Christians were Jews. Crispus was the ruler of the synagogue. That, that's pretty significant for him to convert to Christianity. He's a key convert. It means that people that were already saved in other cities are praying for their relatives in this city. It means that, that the people that are in this city, God is beginning to act upon their conscience and God's beginning to prepare them. And, and, and there's people in that city who are desperate and maybe contemplating suicide or drug addicted or perverse and would cry out to God that they don't even know. And then God would bring the word to them. It's amazing whenever I'm witnessing and I feel an unusual attendant help from God. There's times just heaven falls. I've learned to ask and speculate. I'll often say, you've recently prayed and asked God to help you. And it's amazing how often they'll say yes, because I know the way God works. When somebody cries out to God, he will arrange an encounter. He will in arrange an encounter with the gospel, and you have to have this confidence. It means God's moving new people into the area. It means that God is softening them. 
I told the story recently about New York when I was pioneering and I had a handful of people in my church and we went to downtown uh, Schenectady, very urban, very um, fast paced and city scene. And we're, we're standing there and we all kind of went our ways. And I'm, I, I have a handful of tracks and I'm thinking, where do I start? And I looked and I saw a young man sitting at a bus stop. And I just went up, handed him a track and did my best to explain the plan of salvation. And then I paused and I said, what do you think of that? He looked at me, I'll never forget. He said, I've been waiting for three years for somebody to tell me that. He said, I'm so desperate that I was considering right now throwing myself in front of one of these buses. His name was Gus and he got saved and he became a part of my church from that day. That was, that was a divine setup. In other words, God arranged this encounter. God had been dealing with this young man. God had been preparing him. They're not all that way, but there's enough of them out there. And God said, that's why you just speak. Because I have many people in this city. Third century letter they discovered. A man named Cyprian wrote a letter to his friend, Donatus. This is an expert, an, an excerpt from that letter. This is a quote from this man's letter. He said this, It's a bad world, Donatus, an incredibly bad world. But I have discovered in the midst of it a quiet and good people who have learned the great secret of life. They have found a joy and wisdom which is a thousand times better than any of the pleasures of our sinful life. They are despised and persecuted, but they don't care. They are masters of their souls. They have overcome the world. He closed his letter by saying, these people do donate us are Christians, and I am one of them. That is the power of evangelism. And the truth remains the same for us and our generation, wherever we are, wherever God has enlisted us, some have heard the word of God before and the seed has germinated. Some have been saved and are backslidden. Some have never heard, but they're going to get saved because God said, I have many people in this city. When I was in Farmington, I had a, a man, a pilot get saved or come into the church and get really captured by the evangelism. And he would go on outreach and... Um, he said one day he just got tired of just spinning his wheels and he said, God, I don't have that much time. Would you just direct me to somebody that you've dealt with? And the next door he knocked on, the guy opened the door and he said, listen here, I, I came to tell you about Jesus and the guy's jaw almost hit the floor. He said, I just prayed. I just prayed and asked God to send somebody to tell me about him. And from there he was on. He was a pilot and he would fly from the little regional cities in the southwest. And because he was a pilot, he would often have like 45 minute layovers between his next flight. So he said, okay, a new airport. And he would go out into the concourse and he'd say, okay, God, all right, I only got 45 minutes. Show me. He's like, he's walking around waiting for a little ping in his heart. You know, he just had this confidence that he is going to have a divine appointment with somebody that's going to get saved. Got a call from Brad um, this afternoon as he's on his way to the city with Saturday Outreach. And he had a couple of the guys with him. And he was talking to me about a strategy. They were just going to go and witness and maybe pray for the sick. And I said, God's going to help you. Just go down there and, and talk talk about Christ and offer to pray for people. And I got a text right as I was coming in to, uh, to preach from Liam. He said, Pastor, victory report. He said, I was witnessing to some guy and he was just about to commit suicide. He had just heard that his child had passed away and he came off like a, a, a number of days being drunk. And he said, I told him about Jesus and he got saved and he's going to begin to tune into the live stream and he gave me his number and he's going to let me uh, 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 work with him. And I thought, that's, that's it right there. Do you know how many people there are like that right now? Right now. In whatever area you're in, whatever city you're in, 
God has many people in your city. And you can't be discouraged at the dry times and you can't give up when you get some pushback because God wants to help you to be fruitful all the way to Christ's return. With that, I want to change the order of the service. I believe there's people you tuned into this service by a divine appointment. You're not saved or you're backslidden. Some of you prayed. You knew you were tuning into a church and you said, you know what, God, if you're real, you got to talk to me and God's talking right to you because he's prepared you for this moment. He loves you. And yet he needs your cooperation to save you. The Bible says that with your heart you believe unto righteousness. With your mouth confession is made to salvation. Jesus Christ died for us. He paid for our sins. Otherwise, there's no hope for us. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. And without the blood of Jesus, we're going to pay the price of sin, which is death. But Jesus was sinless, and he died in our place, and he rose from the dead. And now he gives us the option to turn from our sin and put faith in his death, burial, and resurrection. And upon doing that, a miracle can take place. And there's people right now, you're going to get a miracle. And if you want to do that, I believe you do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to say these words out loud. Right where you are, I want you to say, Father God, I know I'm a sinner, but I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God who died on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead. Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin. I'm asking you to come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I want to be born again. Change me. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and help me with deliverance from every bondage. I accept this forgiveness and I thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. If you prayed that prayer, I appreciate the privilege of being able to lead you in that prayer. And I'm going to ask you to communicate with somebody. Communicate with the pastor of the church that's um, hosting this. And let somebody know in the church so that they can begin to help you and equip you and work with you. Christians, God's stirring you afresh for the potential that you have and God knows everything about us, and he's still pleased to use us. And the people in the book of Acts were just like you and I, common people with their flaws and their failures. But he just says, don't be afraid. Speak. I have many people in your city. I want you to find a place to pray. We're going to pray together after we're done.